So, welcome everyone to this uh, new episode of Philosophy Gets Personal. Today, it's my great pleasure to have here as uh, our guest, uh, Professor Scott Churchill. Um, Scott uh, taught uh, at the University of Dallas for 42 years. Uh, he taught classes on uh, primate studies in coordination with Jane Goodall Institute. Uh, he's also a cinema critic. Uh, he's been a local TV film critic for 40 years. Uh, he works in eco psychology and eco cinema. And uh, he's been actively involved in the APA Council and uh, in the Society for Humanistic Psychology, the Society for Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology, um, the International Human Science Research conference and the list uh, could go on and on and on because uh, Scott uh, is uh, a super active member of uh, our um, not only academic community but uh, really uh, to, to contribute for knowledge in general so Scott uh, thanks for uh, being here today it's uh, a great pleasure for me thank you for having me Susie I'm looking forward to our chat yeah, um, from where can we start? Uh, I know that you love traveling, that uh, your uh, nature is brings you always out there to explore uh, new places, uh, your beloved Italy, uh, but uh, the whole world is, uh, is your shell. Uh, is somehow happiness for you connected to this uh, nature? Um, how how would you define happiness? Uh, what uh, brings you to this sense of exploration? Have you ever felt uh, anxious about uh, uh, some new area of life to explore? I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, I'm going to go back because okay. when you talk, mention nature and exploring mm -hmm. and even traveling, this is my free association. So Freud yeah. tells us to trust the first thing you there. think. Yeah. I think back to when I was about three, three and a half years old. And my mother wow. would take mm -hmm. me for walks behind the apartment building where we lived in this little town in New Jersey. And the name of the apartments was Brookside. And that's because the apartments stood alongside this brook, a little babbling brook. Um, and she wanted me to feel... Uh, not only free, but safe mm -hmm. in nature. And I can remember even at this moment when she taught me first how to walk across a brook without falling into the water, without stepping off the stone and, you know, how to yeah. test the stone and then put yeah. your weight on it. And then she trusted me to really leave the house when I was so young and walk around in the woods and come home. So uh, she kind of gave me the courage Mm -hmm. and the initiative to uh, uh, step out into the world and not to be a mama's boy or not to be just staying at home and not wanting to leave the house. So from a very early age, um, mm -hmm. I felt encouraged to look to see what was on the other side of the brook. And that mm -hmm. was more interesting yeah. to me than what was here. And I now, now it's like what's happening on the other side of the ocean, whether it's the Atlantic <laughs> or the Pacific, you know. What what can I find over there? How do you combine this with uh, your working life, uh, with daily obligations, uh, with the uh, scholarly work? Well, it's very difficult, except uh, uh, the nice thing about being an academic is that uh, if you have the right situation, your time is your own. And so I've always made my, my teaching times to be convenient to my uh, preference to have my mornings to myself, I like to go outside. We have a, an outdoor jacuzzi where I live and nobody's here during the day. So mm -hmm. I like to go out there and meditate and contemplate the universe, sit under the trees. At night, it's like a, a Magritte painting mm -hmm. where the sky looks uh, uh, blue like it's daylight, but at nighttime it's uh, and the ground is dark and you look up and you can see the moon and the clouds moving through the sky. I just like to focus in on the, the, the environment itself. Uh, even before seeing an animal um, mm. or before noticing this or that plant, just breathing 
and feeling connected to the universe. And then combining that with academic life, uh, I take my laptop outside or I take my books outside. I have my student work. Actually, I don't like to bring the laptop outside. That's only in an emergency. I like mm -hmm. to bring the printed papers, the journals outside with me and sit under a tree uh, and do my readings out there, take a book outside and read. So I always like to feel connected uh, to where I am. How does this connect with uh, eco-psychology? Well, that's been my uh, my recent love in uh, expanding phenomenology away from the uh, interiority of the first person singular to the uh, first person plural. And then uh, with Merleau-Ponty making that step into the life world itself. Well, with Husserl and all of the phenomenologists. But um, and that's a I little really bit more because uh, uh, here the audience might not know what phenomenology is or what the ah. first person, the second person involve. Uh, tell us a little bit more. Okay. Thanks. So, you know, the philosophy of phenomenology which began over a hundred years ago uh, with our, um, our founder, Edmund Husserl. He was a German philosopher who wanted to understand how human consciousness was at the basis of all of knowledge, of all understanding of the world, that it wasn't just that we were a blank slate, as uh, other philosophers like to say, that we really just receive impressions of the universe, but that we are active constituting agents. Actually, one of the people who makes this most clear is an obscure German biologist whose name is Jakob von Uckskuhl, who was the teacher of the famous Conrad Lorenz. Mm -hmm. And when you ask anyone in the field of animal behavior or ethology, who is the father of ethology? They say, well, Conrad Lorenz, he's the guy who was walking past the, the, the geese that were hatching from their eggs and the mother wasn't there and all the geese started to follow him. Mm -hmm. And that's when he learned the principle of imprinting. But in any case, he became the father of ethology, but his teacher was, Jakob von Uckskuhl, and Uckskuhl was an Estonian biologist in the late 19th century, and he worked out of Germany in the 20th, but he had a fascinating idea. Uh, since he was European, he was classically educated, and therefore he was a Kantian back in those days in Germany, and the philosophy of Immanuel Kant was called a transcendental philosophy, and for Kant, that meant that each animal, not just each human being, each animal was a transcendental subject that constituted its own time and space. Now, I take this into the biology classroom because I have these biology students at my university. I co-teach this course called Tropical Ecology mm. and Eco-Psychology. Mm -hmm. And these biology students only know how to pass tests taking multiple choice questions of fact. But they love to be given permission to see the world through their own eyes, but also to imagine seeing the world through the eyes of an animal. I often say to them, it's much more interesting to study the animal in its milieu, in the presence of other animals, rather than to put it on the, in the lab and dissect it, to oh, look yeah. inside, to see what's happening. You know, uh, So this was a biologist at school who believed that the most fascinating work of biology would have to do with an understanding and description of the world's of animals as constituted by their sensory apparatus and their ability to move around, their locomotor apparatus. And when you synthesize uh, these um, perceptual and locomotor capacities that every animal has, think about the difference between a bird and a worm and an octopus and a human. When you synthesize the world of perception and the world of action, you get what he called the Umwelt. That's a German word for environment, but for him, it meant the bubble that you would step into. If you could step into the bubble of perception and the bubble of locomotion of any animal, it would be a different world than the world that you and I inhabit. And so what I like to do even in the classroom with the biology students is to try to open their eyes and their imaginations mm -hmm. and move away from simple facts about the body of the animal to to try to enter into an imagination of the experience that that animal has of its environment. And from there, it's not a far jump to follow 
Heidegger and Binswanger, who are the philosophers, the German philosophers who brought existential thinking to us, uh, it was Binswanger who then applied this to the world of the patient. And mm. suddenly psychopathologists are writing about the world of the compulsive, the world of the schizophrenic, the world of the hysteric, um, the world of the obsessive compulsive. Mm -hmm. What is that world that is constituted by this particular psychological mindset uh, and this body set? Because it's not just a mind. The mind is essentially part of a, of a physical body that sees, breathes, and moves. So mm -hmm. the idea of movement, the idea of perception, and the idea of a world that is given to us through this apparatus is just fascinating to me. And very, very. Yeah. How can we make sure that we don't uh, impose uh, our view on uh, the second perspective that we are looking at? Ah, that's a very good question. It's a very good question because our tendency is to immediately think that, well, I look at the person over there and she is smiling. And therefore, she must be feeling what I feel when I smile, a kind of reasoning by analogy. But that's really not what's happening spontaneously in our experience. Even the, um, the infant in the arms of the mother, this is where we learn empathy for the first time. We look into the mother's eyes and she smiles. And as her face begins to smile, unbeknownst to us, our own face is smiling along with hers. Our own motor uh, neurons in our facial muscles begin to arrange themselves in such a way that we are mimicking the other. And we're not intentionally causing our face to do this. Our bodies do this naturally. So the empathic response is not one of projecting my own interior uh, feelings onto someone else. My empathic response, which is the natural response that we have as animal subjects, mammal subjects, is to resonate with the emotive, emotional expression that we see over there in the face of the other. And soon we are wearing their face on our face. And soon we are attuned to something that transcends us. It's no longer our first person experience. When the smile on your face puts a smile on my face, now we have an intersubjective phenomenon going on here where mm -hmm. it's not a matter of each person remaining encapsulated in their own interiority, but rather we have a shared moment and uh, a shared moment of joy, of ecstasy, of, of living in the eyes of the other, of feeding off of the eyes and the attention of the other. So it's a matter of being able to look at yourself while the other is making a way in, yours, in you. So being able to catch uh, uh, how much of the other is in you, is uh, blossoming in you in this, uh, in this moment. Yes. I, I know that uh, you pursue that yeah, good part of your career was uh, focused on uh, studying bonobos. Uh, and uh, for you, it wasn't just, uh, you know, opening a book and uh, sitting there. And, no. Yeah, it was, uh, again, a, a very felt experience that uh, you were there. Uh, it became uh, a friend, if I may. I mean, uh, you managed to connect uh, deeply uh with uh, with the bonobo do, do you want to tell us about this study your experience and uh, how it connects uh, with what uh, we are saying here yes sure um well, actually this goes back my gosh at least 25 years and um in that time i used to take my students on field trips to the dallas and to the fort worth zoos and back then i didn't even know what a bonobo was uh, I just knew about chimpanzees and bonobos were originally called pygmy chimpanzees because they were smaller. And then it was realized over a hundred years ago that they really were a completely separate species. Pan uh, paniscus is the bonobo and pan troglodyte is the uh, common chimpanzee that we all know. So we were standing outside uh, the chimpanzee outdoor exhibit and it was drizzling rain. And I thought, oh my gosh, nothing is gonna happen today. And so I was trying to talk to my group of students about these chimps that were sitting against the wall so far away from us, 
huddling, you know, against the wall as tightly as they could so that the drizzling rain didn't get too much on them because they don't like water. Mm -hmm. And while I was talking, I was saying something about how they uh, use body gestures. And I noticed one of them was looking at me and he was moving his shoulders. Uh, he was wiggling his body a little bit. And so while I was talking, I didn't do it on purpose. While I was talking later, my students said, did you know that you started moving your body like the bonobo? Your shoulders started moving and uh, then his shoulders started moving more. And this was like a couple hundred feet away. And at some point I said, you know, sometimes they use head bobs and my head started to go up and down. And lo and behold, the bonobo over there against the wall in the rain, he begins to nod his head. So at this point, I think, I think he actually sees me over here. And I knew that they could respond to gestures and pointing because they do that themselves. So I kind of pointed to an area where there was a glass window that you could look through. And I had to run around and go there. And when I got there, this bonobo comes walking up to me and looks right in through the glass and he puts the back of his hand against the glass and he taps it. And so I tapped it and then he put the other hand and I tapped that one. And then he went back and forth from one hand to the other. And before we knew it, we were doing a kind of dance together. It mm -hmm. didn't last too long, but maybe 20 minutes and someone was taking video of this. And we had this whole amazing encounter where he introduced himself by pointing to himself, you know, beating his, not beating his fist on his chest, but his open hands, as if to say, here I am. And mm -hmm. I did the same thing. And the more he bobbed his head, the more I bobbed my head. And before we knew it, we had a big crowd of people I didn't realize at the time mm -hmm. watching. And at the end of this uh, exchange where he was actually soliciting for me to massage him through the window by pounding the side of my hands against the window while he leaned his body there. And then I'd say, you want more? And he would lean away and then put his body back and I would give him more massage. You want more? And he would do the same thing. This went on and on. And we were both in this uh, this moment where we never took our eyes off of each other's eyes and our bodies were just doing the rest. You know, people will sometimes say, well, how do you do that with the animal? And I say, you know, think of the Wizard of Oz where the the, the good witch tells the Dorothy, you know, who wants to go home. Well, you've been wearing your red slippers all of this time. All you have to do is click them. And like Dorothy mm -hmm. in The Wizard of Oz, we all have this uh, power of empathy to respond mm -hmm. to the presence of the other. But we have to do it from within a bracketing of our own perspective. But even more importantly, a putting aside of the preconceptions that we bring with us when we go into a zoo and we simply think, oh, that's a chimpanzee over there and that's a giraffe over there and uh, move on to, from one exhibit to the other. When you, when you bracket this presupposition where you think that you know what the other is, and this by the way happens in racism, it happens in sexism, where we have yeah. our un unwitting assumptions about who the other is, it precludes a connection. But if mm -hmm. we can go to the encounter in a state of innocence, where the innocence includes an epoche, a bracketing of the uh, unneeded presuppositions, then all of a sudden, why not believe that this other sentient being, this bonobo, is another me? And what's most fascinating is that he looked at me as another example of himself. Mm -hmm. It was very clear to me that I was another sentient being, that he didn't want to go with the others to get the bananas and the oranges that they were being fed. He kept looking over, but then he looked back at me and he thought, this is more interesting because <laughs> someone's actually engaging with me. And he didn't <laughs> know the experience of being engaged with by a human being on the other side of the glass. So. Every year I would go back, I would wonder if he might remember. I remember one time arriving at the window and they're feeding them. It was inside this time, but there was still a window and they were feeding the bonobos. And he pauses and looks at me in a moment of recognition. And with his two knuckles, he uh. taps the window like, I'll be right back. And then he comes <laughs> back with an orange and a banana and he sits there and he begins bobbing his head. And I took a candy bar out and I began eating the candy bar while he was eating his banana. Uh -huh. So a kind of friendship emerged over right. some time.
And it was not a formal study. What happened is I happened to mention this to a, a humanistic psychologist who was the president of uh, the American Psych Association Division of Humanistic Psych. And she said she was an animal therapist and an animal healer. <laughs> Uh, Eleanor Criswell uh -huh. out in San Francisco in the Bay uh -huh. Area in uh -huh. Sonoma, actually. Yeah. Eleanor is still alive and well and out there. We, and we just named an award after her. Um, uh -huh. She does uh, distant healing with animals. You could put her on the phone to someone with a sick horse in Connecticut and she would diagnose them and the uh -huh. horse would get better. Uh -huh. So she said, you need to write about this stuff. And I said, write about what? And she said, I'll publish it in my journal, Somatics. So I did. I started writing a description. I thought, well, how do I write this? Mm -hmm. So I thought, Alfonso Lingus, who is the greatest of the living phenomenologists, philosophers, who travels the world, and he comes back and in simple language with no jargon, with no references to Heidegger or Kant, he just describes the world as it appears to him and his encounters with the people and the things and the works of art that he encounters, the rivers and the trees. So I tried to channel a little bit of Al, who's a friend of mine. And I said, maybe if I can describe this encounter in a, um, uh -huh. in a playful and evocative way. So I, it began with standing in the drizzle at the Fort Worth Zoo. Uh, I looked over at him and we, you know, and I didn't say what I was looking over at. I just had two sentences to whet the appetite of the reader. Mm -hmm. And then I, couple spaces and I start writing about this experience of the bonobo and then later went back into the description so it was almost writing the way you would write a movie script to mm -hmm. um, try to take it's a pedagogical approach to try to take the reader by the hand by first sinking the hook giving them a moment of a living experience to hold on to mm -hmm. and then uh, now that they have that in mind they can follow the rest of what you're saying when you make a point of reference to this experience. So my love of the philosophy of phenomenology, when Merleau-Ponty, for your uh, listeners, who is the French philosopher who um, described what he called the reversibilities of the flesh. Well, that's an abstract concept, but when I'm standing in front of the bonobo and we're both bobbing our heads and hitting the wall at the same time with our hands, suddenly the students can see the mirroring the reversibilities of the flesh of the human and the animal, of the mother and the infant. It's all based on this model of uh, this interpersonal framework, this we. It's experiencing the other within the we. And there's a primacy in this eco-phenomenology. There's a primacy of the we, of the me in the world is the starting point, rather than the cogito, the I think. I think, therefore, I am from Descartes. That's a uh, lot for your listeners. It's a lot. <laughs> it's Sorry. a lot that I can uh, give the references under the on uh, the website for yes. those who want to go through all these wonderful um, philosophers and thinkers you mentioned. But so, what uh, what would you answer to the people who think uh, um, that empathy uh, can be explained through neuro mirrors? Uh, and um, a cognitive answer to what they are in front of. I don't think it's explainable that way, but what happens, okay, let me give you an analogy. Do you remember many years ago, maybe not in my lifetime, maybe before your lifetime began, Susie, but many years ago, they discovered in uh, Torino, in Torino in it it Italy, the shroud mm -hmm of Turin is what it is called, the shroud that was supposed to have been placed over Jesus when uh, he was in the tomb. Okay. And this, ah, okay. this shroud mm -hmm. is claimed to have captured the after image of Christ at the moment of resurrection, when, his, when he went from a body to being in heaven with his father. And uh, the belief is that the belief of Christianity is that Jesus did not simply die, but was resurrected, the body and the life everlasting. But they found this shroud in mm -hmm. Torino and on the shroud, there was uh, they opened it up and they said, oh, my gosh, look, you can almost see the face of Jesus right here. 
like it was a flash, like a moment, a photographic image uh, faintly existing on this piece of cloth. And suddenly a superstitious mind looks at this and says, this is the after image of the moment of resurrection. This is the proof of Christianity. And they began to take this shroud around, even when I was in the university here 40 years ago, it was touring the country like uh, King Tut's uh, uh, treasures from Egypt. They were they were taking the shroud of, G of Turin around from museum to museum and showing it to people and saying, see, now we have proof that Jesus resurrected because right here you can see the flash of the after image of his face on this piece of cloth. Now, if you are a true believer, in your religion, you do not need the Shroud of Turin to mm -hmm. convince you and explain to you what the uh, resurrection is mm -hmm. that's proven by an afterimage. And that's how I feel about mirror neurons. With all respect to Galeza and Valeria, the, the, the wonderful, uh, the, 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 the Italian uh, neuroscientists from Parma, they did great advances and they were very clever in calling this neuron. Yeah, I think it's the universal yeah. part of yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And what they did is they, 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 they put some kind of an MRI. I don't know how they did this while the monkey was you know moving around, but they were able to show the monkey brain and the monkey goes over, it's a rhesus monkey, and he picks up a stick. And the moment he picks up a stick, a certain white flash happens in the brain. And they say, oh, that must be the neuron that corresponds to the act of picking up the stick. Now, I don't know if there's only one neuron that lights up when I pick up a stick or a fork or a knife or a cup of coffee, but let's just go with that. And then they discovered that the same monkey still wearing the same MRI machine on its head, uh, when the experimenter picked up the same stick, in the brain of the monkey, the same neuron lit up. Now, I don't know how they knew it was the same one because neurons are very tiny. You need a microscope to see them. All they knew is that a, a light lit up in the sky of the darkness on the image of the brain. See, we're getting close to the shroud of Torino <laughs> where now instead of the shroud with the after flash of, of metamorphosis of uh, resurrection, now we have a flashing white light that shows a brain cell activate. And what they realized was, oh my gosh, it's the same neuron. Again, I don't know how they know it's the same neuron, not the one next to it, but it's the same neuron that is lighting up. Doesn't matter whether the monkey lifts up the hammer or whether I lift up the stick or the hammer. The mm -hmm. same one lines up. It must be something like we'll call it a mirror neuron. Now, brilliant because this term has stuck for 20 25 years everyone talking about mirror neurons and in a way what this metaphor because that's all it is it's a metaphor this metaphor of the mirroring which presupposes that we are aware of the human and the chimp uh, the monkey in the same room picking up a stick given the situation the assumption is made that ah if if the same neuron is firing when each of us picks up the stick, whether it's being perceived by the monkey or whether it's being enacted by the monkey lifting the stick, then this must be the proof of empathy. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying I no more need mirror neurons to believe right now, Susie, that I can see your face smiling through the video that the others can't see. We are both smiling at the same time. I no more need the mirror neuron to explain the empathy that we have in this moment of shared joy and laughter, uh, then the, really, the believer in Jesus needs the shroud of Turin. So I think it's interesting. It's like a correlation. It's interesting that in addition to knowing that there's this phenomenon of empathy, of spontaneous gestural intertwining, where when whether I'm shaking your hand or whether you're giving me a hug or whether we are simply smiling and waving goodbye as the boat goes away. There's a reciprocity, there's a mirroring, there's a way in which we align ourselves behaviorally that 
contains the unspoken message that we are in sync with each other, which is what the bonobo is doing with me at the glass window at the zoo. We are in sync with each other. And are we, is it merely two separate subjects mimicking each other like mirrors? No, we didn't go there with the intention to mirror. We looked into each other's eyes with the intention to connect. And I would say if I was describing my experience within the we of the encounter with the bonobo, that I felt a strong desire on his part to stay within the encounter when I saw him looking at the bananas and oranges that the others were being thrown, and he chose to stay instead. He turned his head back and looked at me and began bobbing his head. It was like he was saying, this is more important to me. Mm -hmm. Now, whether he was thinking this is more important to me or not isn't the point. That's my way as a human of putting into human words what I believe his gestures and his presence was expressing. Our challenge as humans, as philosophers, as scientists, is to try to put into words, that's the meaning of the Greek logos anyway, to speak, to put into words, to illuminate meaning, what is happening and what is observable there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that uh, the old framework of thinking of inside, outside, one person, the other person, it's an interpersonal, intersubjective matrix within which we encounter, we smile, we engage, we shake hands, we hug, we mirror each other's gestures, and then later we think about it. So do you think that uh, the, the answer was completely unexpected, that the, the twist, the angle you took the answer from is very <laughs> creative and I appreciate it. Anyway, but do you think, uh, no, what do you think about uh, um, uh, those people who seem to not have empathy. Do you think that empathy is something that uh, everyone has uh, and uh, more or less has to learn to use it? Uh, or is it really true that, uh, yeah, we are in this uh, we intersubjective uh, structure, but maybe some of us do not feel, are excluded or do not feel inside, they self-exclude themselves. Uh, what does it happen when empathy is lacking? It's another good question. And I uh, I don't think anyone has um, like the answer to that, but I can address mm -hmm. that question, I think. And that is, if when we observe the empathy that clearly exists between mother and infant among other primates, because they're very close to us and we can see even on the faces of, of rhesus monkeys, as well as bonobos and gorillas, we can see the mother's attention and care for its infant. I really believe that developmentally speaking, it begins in our attachment to the mothering one. And I say that because it may be, in your case, you as a mother with your child, but let's say that I am taking care of the child while my uh, partner is away. Um, I become the mothering one, so to speak, when I'm attending to its needs and focused on it. And I think it's in these moments that the, uh, the this protoplasm, this, this being that we call a baby, is awakened to this experience of empathy that I really think begins with the mother's smile. Mm -hmm. And not just a laugh type, happy, you know, joy, uh, silly smile, but a loving smile. Mm -hmm. A smile of adoration. Think about this. Mm -hmm. If the most primal core of your own consciousness emerges in the context of experiencing the adoring, loving smile of the mother, which immediately puts the smile on the baby's face. And later when the mother reappears, even if she's not smiling, if that infant goes into the smile of the infant, the mother melts into it. Mm -hmm. It's in, immediate. It is not mediated by cognition. It is a, you know, God-given Dorothy wearing the red shoes. It's something that we all have as a possibility. You know, the phenomenologists like Heidegger talk about potentialities for being, sein können, to be able to. It's, a, it's an aptitude that must be released. 
So let's make a jump. I referred earlier to Conrad Lorenz. What was it that he discovered with imprintings? It was social imprinting. That when within a certain amount of time, the baby duck or goose hatches and sees something moving, good chance that it's its mother. It doesn't know what a mother is, but it's, it has survival value to follow that thing. Mm -hmm. This phenomenon of social imprinting is something that takes place at an early stage in life. And what some people think, uh, like Timothy Leary, who is the one who first studied psychedelics seriously before he was ridiculed for it, he believed that psychedelics could be a way to do therapy with psychopaths in prisons. Oh, and yeah. back in the 1970s, he was giving 25 micrograms of LSD-25 to prisoners in the, in the Massachusetts General uh, uh, Penitentiary. And he was teaching psychopaths that it wasn't cool to be a psychopath. And it was essentially before we had the word microdosing, because he would say a normal dose of LSD was 200 micrograms, which is, by the way, that's a thousandth of a, of a milligram. So there's a very tiny amount. Really micro microdosing, that's where that term comes from, because it's one millionth of a gram of this chemical and only 25 millionths are you giving to the person just enough to break through the social mindset of sociopathy, of psychopathy, of, 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 of not feeling a connection or care for the other? And what he was doing as a, uh, as a psychologist working in Harvard with people like Gordon Alport, a great humanistic psychologist as his teacher, Mm -hmm. um, he was learning how to re-imprint these prisoners. So what the point is here is that this capacity for empathy is not just some philosophical concept that you would have to read a book by someone to have. We already have this potentiality for being, this capacity, this aptitude as part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. But it requires something in the environment to trigger it, just like the geese must have their imprinting triggered by a moving object, mm -hmm. which it then follows. The psychopath needs to have something that brackets their normal, their typical, I should say, but abnormal social style of selfishness, egocentrism, exploitation, and even sadism. They need to break out of that in order to experience a new way of being with others. And that was the goal of Timothy Leary in the early seventies. You can find all of this in the literature. Um, and when the warden found out that he was going to be helping prisoners to be released from prison, they stopped the program. He mm -hmm. wrote about this in his uh, book, Exo Psychology. They uh, stopped the program because the warden was looking at building more and more buildings and more prisons. The idea was not to uh, was not to cure psychopathy. It was to uh, collect all of these people and put them in prison. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. that's another interesting path to take. Yeah. Unfortunately, our time is almost uh, up already. Uh, it flew by. It's incredible. But I want to ask you. A last question, which is uh, the usual question of our um, podcast, and it's a big one. So what do you think is the meaning of life, if uh, life has any meaning? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's always um, the reaction. Wow. You know, you're mm. asking someone who's got one foot in biology, another foot in psychology, and then... Uh, each of my arms in a different branch of the humanities and, and philosophy. So each of those disciplines would, it's like the, the image of the six Indians, each touching a different part of the elephant, um, with the meaning of life. But really, mm -hmm. um, if we want to say meaning as pointing in the direction of um, a purpose, or even a purpose not as something deliberately sought, but as an implicit goal, an implicit telos. You know, you, you spoke with me earlier about happiness, what mm -hmm. makes people happy. And I don't want it to sound like a cliche, but if there is meaning to life, 
we might call it the pursuit of you know life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but not just happiness as a state of mind that we can achieve if I take this pill or drink this coffee or buy this shirt or go on this trip. You know, it's not a matter of finding things uh, as a means to this end. I think that the happiness, this uh, feeling of at oneness with the universe is something is a, is a is a way of finding oneself that only comes about under certain circumstances. And those are the circumstances where life becomes meaningful, even before we put into words how wonderful the vista is. When last summer I was standing at the top of the hill in Naples at uh, the um, Sant'Elmo castle and looking out at Vesuvius. And in this moment, I just felt this overwhelming sense of where I was. I was at a loss to know who I was, but I was completely there looking from side to side and absorbing this vista. Um, in that moment, in moments like that, where you feel released and connected and spiritually awakened, um, those are the kinds of moments that I live for. And mm -hmm. uh, if I were to, if someone were to say, you know, what are the most meaningful things that happen to you in life? They're shared moments. There are moments, there's mo whether it's I'm sharing this image that, uh, on Facebook with my family and friends and they say, oh, I wish I were there with you. Even standing alone on the top of a hill looking at a beautiful valley is a mm -hmm. moment that you are implicitly sharing with this we that we originally come from and return to. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Beautiful. That's very beautiful. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, this wonderful talk we had together. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.